on. And while you're turning there, I want to mention a couple of announcements I missed earlier. Uh, we are looking for some more families to help sponsor the college students of our missionaries. And Trish, I saw you somewhere. Raise your hand with you, Trish. Trish is over there. If you don't know Trish Rupel, um, her phone number will be, in, I think, in the bulletin on Wednesday night. But if you'd like to help just look after missionary college students. There are these young people that come to America and maybe spent their whole life in another country. And they're, they're Americans on the outside, but they're not Americans in the inside. They're, you know, they're from every country around the globe. And um, thinking about our missionaries, counseling with missionaries, I, uh, I just some time ago thought, we need to look after these people some more. One of my good friends down in um, Argentina, uh, he talked to me one day, his, his, he had three boys and they were middle teen years. And he said, Brother Bruce, we were in the bus ministry together in college. He said, Brother Bruce, my kids aren't American. I said, okay. <laughs> he said, I wanted to be American. I said, well, you married a girl from South America and you've had three kids, you've raised them their whole life in Brazil, maybe they're Brazilian. And he said, no, oh, I don't know. And he, he's wanting to send them to American Bible college. They hardly speak English. And <laughs> You know, they, they got a great church, great college, whatever. But, but uh, you know, we think of young people like Chris and Rebecca going to the mission field, but 15 years from now, there's turmoil going on. You know, I took Victor Montero and the three younger Montero kids to lunch today, and Crystal packed up her little boy and took him off. And where does, where's Rachel? How come you lost out? And Rachel McDowell, how come you lost out? You know, your sister-in-law is more pushy than you or something. But anyway, and, and uh, Pat, uh, Rachel's wife, took Josiah and headed off. And today, Ken Peterson took off with Tim. And it's not even his freshman year. But somebody's got to make sure that who the roommates are, make sure they make the bed right. And, <laughs> right, Brother George? Send them out of there. But um, imagine, imagine sending your firstborn to another continent. And just, just a matter of loving people, it's just, just caring. I remember Hannah being in the emergency room in Indiana and me being just a little bit frustrated that she had something bad enough to go to the hospital and some dorm soup drove her there and dropped her off and left her. You know how many papers you fill out in an emergency room? And, and she never filled out a paper before. And uh, she calls me to get something. She says, and guess who's in the room right here waiting also to be admitted to the hospital? Rick Martin's daughter from the Philippines and suddenly I felt well that's not bad I could get on a plane and in four hours I could be at that hospital Rick Martin Rick Martin couldn't be to Manila in four hours and uh, so but uh, let's think about our missionaries college students that are far from home and and Trish will walk you through whatever you need to do just little things just remember a birthday um, send them something at Thanksgiving or Christmas and you don't have to finance it come to me come to us and let us look after our young people and when I travel to different Bible colleges I try to grab them and go with, to take them with us to lunch, and we make them honorary Wildemarians. And uh, these people matter, they matter, and their parents. If you want to do something good to me, love my kids. And I think if I want to do something good for our missionaries, love their children, and that'll be a help. So if you'd like to help with sponsoring some missionary college students, pray and form, uh, you see Trish Rupel. And also we could use some help on our security if some of you men are available. Like the girl years ago, our church was pretty young at the time, and, she was about 16. She walked up to me after church one day and said, Preacher, you care if I work in the nursery? And at that time, church was small. We didn't have any teens in the nursery. I said, well, I, I don't know. She said, well, I don't really care much for the preaching anyway. I just will do something worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you know, God humbles us. So I said, well, as soon as you start liking the preaching, then you can work in nursery. Anyway, God's good. Philippians chapter 1 in your Bible. Philippians chapter 1. Let's stand as we read a couple of verses together. Philippians chapter 1. And let's make sure our phones are off. If you wouldn't mind, that would be a help to all of us. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read just a couple of verses. Paul, writing from prison, is writing to the Philippian people in verse 18. Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. 
But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And let's pray. Father, help us tonight. I pray you'd speak to our hearts and, and give us some things that would uh, keep us motivated, keep us stirred, keep us passionate, keep our dreams and visions alive, and even guard us in the matter of the world and the attractions of it. I pray for your help tonight, please, that, we, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul was writing to the Philippian people, and in the verses prior to the ones we just read, he explained that he had been in prison and uh, that while he was in prison, some people were preaching Christ and some of them were trying to make him look bad. Some of them were trying to cause him grief. And, and it was just a difficult time for the Apostle Paul. It's bad enough being in jail. It's worse having false preachers trying to make you look bad and trying to, to hurt you. And Paul said there where we read a moment ago in verse 18, whether in pretense, they were pretentious, they were pretending to be something they weren't, or whether in truth, Paul said, I rejoice that Christ is preached. That's good enough for me. Uh, they may not be just like me. They may not do things just like I do them, but I'm grateful the gospel is being preached. Verse 19, Paul says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Not, not, not saying Paul's not saved. He's in prison, and he's looking to the day he'll get out of prison. And he probably, people debate on it some, and I don't know, but he spent probably the majority of his life or the remainder of his life in prison. But he said, for I know this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. He said, you pray for me, and God's going to get me out of this, and we're going to go on, and we're going to do this and this, and it's going to be good. And verse 20, according to my, to my earnest expectation and my hope. And that little phrase there is what I want to talk about here. Paul had an earnest expectation. Paul was not done dreaming. Paul was old. He'd started churches all over Asia Minor. Paul had started churches and revisited churches, and Paul had traveled, and Paul had, Paul had been so involved in the ministry. Paul had gone through just about anything a man could imagine in the ministry, from persecution and, and uh, ill treatment and all kinds of difficulties he'd gone through, shipwrecks and beatings, and boy, he went through so much. And here we find Paul saying, if you'll keep praying, I believe God will let me out. And I have this earnest expectation. I have these dreams. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, and he, and he said that I don't want in anything I do now for Christ, I don't want to be ashamed. I want to be bold. And, and I want Christ to be magnified in my body. If, if I live, I want to be magnified. If I die, I want to be magnified. But I don't want in any way for me to bring any reproach on the gospel of Christ. And I just have one passion that God would, would fulfill my expectation that my life would glorify Jesus Christ. Paul had dreams. And we'll read about them, some of them in a, in a minute or two here. But um, let me just say that uh, as a church, we're three plus decades into this thing. And a lot of you have been around here a long time. And if you were to ask the young people here who grew up in our church, who are now adults and have teenagers for children, they would tell you that one of the things they loved about this was the passion. Jared Veerster, I almost was gonna, I was gonna ask you to come up, Jared, but you, you got bailed out. But a little while ago, a few weeks ago, Jared and I were talking. He began recounting the excitement when he and Pat McDowell and Manny Tanuyan and Victor, Victor and others went back to Bible college together and the excitement in their heart, the passion uh, to, to build the biggest bus route and to reach the most souls and to go out and, and to see something happen with their life. And, and he was just talking about the dreams of young people and what they wanted to do. You know, dreaming is a young person thing. Young people dream of being firemen or policemen or whatever. And in a good church, young people dream of serving God and doing great things for God. And whether they're preachers or missionaries or whether they're the, the background support or whether they're the inner workings of a ministry like this where there's countless teachers and workers, a church like this is built on dreams and visions and goals and people who, who just have a dream. When we started the church, Mrs. Goddard and I came here, and, and again, uh, I, I realize that some people that are starting churches now 
uh, they'll talk and they'll say, yeah, well, that was over 30 years ago you did it. Well, I'd do it again if I could figure out how to get rid of all these people and start over. But I'm sorry, I've got a church. You know, don't, don't take success and throw it out the door just because you haven't got enough grit and passion to go do something. And, and, uh, and understand this, you young men, America has been built spiritually by churches that never saw 100 people in it. And I over and over and have proven that, but the average person in America who's saved and living for God got saved through the ministry of a church that never saw 100 people in it. And I believe one of the reasons is lots of people can pastor a church running 100. A lot of people can't run a church 1,000 or two or 3,000. We all want these big dreams. You know, I've got pictures in my office of... of um, Charles Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. And on the second floor, there was a protruding balcony that kind of came out, oh, almost halfway of our auditorium. And there were people underneath him and people behind him and people all around him on three different balconies. It was a wooden building without any fire extinguishers or fire sprinklers, praise God, for no stupid government buttoned into the ministry of building churches for God. But you know, not many people can do that. Maybe he's the only one in history that could do that. And he had those 5,000 plus people filled that thing three and four times a Sunday to the point where sometimes he'd just make an announcement, if you're a church member, you can't come to church next weekend. We're trying to reach lost people. Would you please stay away? Not many people are doing that today. Uh, just not many at all. And at one point, somebody, some of the deacons in his church or some of the leaders in his church got a little peeved at him for some of the things he wanted to build or do. And he said, if you're not going to build something here with me, I'm leaving. I'll go across town. We'll start another one. You just stay here and have this church die on your hands. That's not normal either for a guy with a church running, running thousands. But this whole story of dreaming, young churches and young people dream. But if you're not careful, as the years go by, as an individual or as a church, you can stop dreaming. For one, your body gets old. And you're tired, and you and you don't your your get up and go got up and went, and um, you know I remember some years ago some of you were with me we were at Bishop, and we'd climb that waterfall, and somehow I have no idea how giant multi-ton boulders would come loose and go rolling down. Tim Eck and I were talking one time off the video click. The uh, this is off the record. It really didn't happen. It's a preaching lie. Uh, some big enough rocks would now I sat at the bottom looked at that waterfall and thought it looks just fine from down here <laughs> and if you're not careful your physical waning things, your health waning, your strength waning, if you're not careful, you'll stop dreaming because you think God's work depends on your strength. And if I understand it right, it depends on his strength. A church gets that way. We start out you might make this cordless work, Don. I don't know if it works tonight. It didn't work for the poor girls. You want to try it? It works good for me. You go back here, and my wife and I, without a dime, without a dollar, without a supporting church, with no sense, that's for sure. And, and, and again, let me say to you young men that are considering the ministry, can I tell you something? God started this church. Brother Ms. Woolley back here. I had no idea they were in Riverside, frustrated with a church that had dropped its stand on the Bible. Don't panic the churches today are changing in the Bible. They were changing 35 years ago too. There, there's always been drifters and, and, and compromises and people who are trying to, to get a crowd by changing something. But I had no idea 30 or 40 miles from here, Brother Miss Willie up there with, with Paula Tanuyan over here, just a little girl, and maybe Paul over here with his family, maybe not even born yet, I don't know. 
I had no idea. I had no idea that God had moved Greg and Kathy Beal over here to Westminster as after they finished school in Michigan to work with Rockwell in a research area. And, and uh, I had no idea the people that God were putting in place up in Montana. An old man sat with Tim and Jackie Heck outside their, their little apartment or their house, wherever it was, and, and uh, little by little talked to them about Christ. And, and they got saved. And then the one place Tim would never go with the Border Patrol was Southern California. No kids born yet. Where was April born down here, Tim? And Tim and Jackie, I had no idea. I didn't know who these people were. All I knew is God put me here. And, and God was moving people from here and here. And I go around the room, and there were other people like this. And little by little, people moving around and moving here and drawing near. No idea what God, by the way, you don't know what God's doing either. We've got no idea what God's doing in our lives. All I know is I had a dream. And it's not just hard work. It's God. How could I have brought those people from all the different directions? Joel Paul drove right to our church the first few Sundays and right past it on the way to the softball games. And, uh, but it only took a few more years till he stopped and we got him there. And, we, and Jesus won over softball. And Paul Young, who would have known? Paul Young, we're meeting six weeks at the Wildemar School. He moved to this little clubhouse behind the USA gas station. And we were in the middle of 75 acres in a building that had nothing around it but a little parking lot and a statue and a fountain. Up on the hill from Baxter to Clinton Keith, if you picture the distance, I'll go up Baxter, Clinton Keith's where the church was, up Baxter, up on the hill was Paul and Gloria Young. They put a house there. God had just moved them from Orange County. And Paul said on Sunday mornings, he'd sit on his porch with his cup of coffee. They'd gone to church in Orange County. They moved out here and got too busy, and they just quit going to church. And Paul said he'd sit on his porch with his cup of coffee watching these crazy people tow buses in. We had buses for nursery and buses for Sunday school and buses for porta potties and we'd carry swamp coolers to put in the back of the buses. I mean, you, you, if you've not seen the videos or you weren't there, you probably don't even believe it could happen. And Paul, Paul, you could ask him, they're on vacation today, but they're here, Gloria runs the bookstore, and Paul does everything around here. I was worried what wouldn't happen today with Paul out of town. But, uh, but you know, Paul, Paul was uh, just watching us. We had no idea he was up on that hill. That 33 years later, he and his wife would be integral parts of the ministry here. Robbie, their high school age son, good boy, got in a motorcycle wreck and died. And they realized we don't have a pastor to bury our boy. And their sons in school were friends with Dave Kirk, one of our teenagers, who's now a faithful member at to Kirk Beard's church up in Hemet. And Dave said, well, our pastor will do the funeral. And it happened to be I was out of town. And where's Mrs. Trewin? Wasn't it Brother Al who did the funeral? But Al, Brother Al was there, and he, he did the funeral. That's where Paul and Gloria Young came from. And they bought into the craziness. And pretty soon, Paul Young was down there helping us put the blanket over the midget wrestlers in their Speedo shorts and take down the beer signs. And it was crazy. Cover up the jukebox and the oldie but moldies. And now, now, look, you know I didn't lead any of those people to Christ. But they all became very key to the ministry here. Who would have known? It's God who does the work. Paul said a little bit later in Philippians, it's God that worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. But it starts with somebody dreaming. Amen. Out on security, Rick Beavers is walking around out there. No idea. When I came to Wildemar to start this church and I started knocking on doors, no idea that Rick was clear up in the north Montana or somewhere up in there, Dakotas, and he was a bus driver. Mrs. Beavers ran the bus program, and they were the, the, bus, the, the bus ministry there in that little church up north, and that God moved them down here. No idea. Moved into Canyon Lake, and they showed up there at that little clubhouse, and again, saved, soul winning, fundamental, loving God, people that God moved from here and moved from there, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the midst of some of the most amazing things in the world going on. You know why? All I had was a dream. I like to say God put people around me who had dreams. And I could go on and on and on to the stories of people. But what God did is God took somebody with a dream. And God brought somebody with dreams. 
and molded that thing together into a church. Now, I worked, my wife worked, she, we'd go soul winning, and she'd, after a little while, she'd say, do you care if I knock on doors the other side of the street? I'm kind of useless just walking along with you. I was waiting for her to just be in awe at my great soul winning potential. And she was bored. She wanted to go knock on doors by herself. <laughs> I married a girl with a dream. The Apostle Paul said, I've got this earnest expectation. I've got this hope. That's 1982 to 1987, whatever year it is now, 2015. Anybody here dreaming still? Because when the dream dies, so does the ministry. You ask anybody in business, ask Brother Mejia if you don't have to have a dream, right? You got plans for this week, right? Oh yeah, I guarantee you, because you're not a success if you're not dreaming. He's dreaming of making money, and I'm dreaming of spending it. <laughs> I'm praying for you young businessmen. Isn't that good, Brother Ray? You young businessmen. I'm praying you prosper. Why? Because I want to spend your money. I've got dreams for your tithes. Get back to the text. I've only got a 20-minute sermon. We've got 45, so I had to come up with some ad lib here. I'd like to suggest that you not lose your desire to see God work. I would wish that you never stop wishing for souls to be saved. I would hope that you would never stop praying that God would deliver some and call others into the ministry. I would hope that you would never lose that longing for the Spirit of God to do something in the hearts of young people. The excitement that we had when using Jared as an example. Do you know what year you went to college, Brother Jared? 92 is what I was thinking. And that was 10 years into our church. We had quite a few go before then, but we were so excited for those young people going off to college. And here, I mean, almost every one of them is still faithful in church, serving God, most of them here, but some in other churches. I think of that year, only one that I can think of after all these years is not serving faithfully in church. You know, the young people going to Bible college just next week, they matter just as much as those ones do. And what God has for them, we don't know. But I know this, when the church stops caring, we got problems. God deliver us from dead churches with budgets met and buildings built and empty baptistries and under unresponsive altar calls. Kirk Beard and I have talked and talked and talked and tried to figure out how to get them a building, and he's met with church after church up in Hemet. I mean, just one of many examples. Pastor's gone, the church is about gone, the building will seat 500 or more bigger than this. A deacon's left with five or six members who come there every Sunday morning. And they sit in one of the little side rooms and have their little Bible study, and they've got huge parking lots, I've seen it, I've driven with him and looked at them, playgrounds, classrooms, all sorts of multi-purpose rooms, kitchens, building, big old auditorium. They've got their six or eight people. And Brother Beard comes and, and talks to them. Could we rent from you? Could we buy it from you? Could we merge? Could we do anything? And they've got their little church, and they've got their little building all paid for, and they've got their little congregation. And some guy who was a deacon when the pastor left felt like he, was, he just always dreamed of being the man of God. They won't rent it. They won't share it. They won't merge. You know what? They lost their vision of doing anything for God, but they're very content just sitting there. Their bills are paid. They've got their church, and they've got their comfort, and they've got money in the bank from years and years of church members tithing. And I think of them like Revelation, where he said, you look like you're a church, but you're not a church. Your candlestick's been removed from its place. You have a name, but you're dead. That's not just one up in Hemet. That's five or six different churches that we know of that he's met with and tried to work with and tried to, to do anything. And here he's got 300 and 400 people and souls being saved and baptized. And they're sitting there in the, in the, the emptiness without people and without the Spirit of God, and without lives being changed. There's something terribly wrong. How could a Christian be content there? There are endless churches in our country where a group of money conscious members who are more who are just as faithless 
as they are conscious of money. America is dying with thousands of empty buildings where no one has a dream. No one has a vision to see God move. I remember when, when Mark Pattison had his senior, or his, uh, his graduation year, Mark, yeah, there, there. remember, I'll never forget your senior year, his graduation. He, he was the valedictorian of his senior class. Of course, he was the only senior. <laughs> it was before we had a school, and, and uh, his parents wanted him in a Christian school, just new Christians. His parents had gotten saved, and, and they put him in a Christian. I remember his, valedictorian, his, his speech, his valedictorian speech. He said, I'm looking forward to my 10th class reunion as we all get together <laughs> to see what God has done with our lives. <laughs> He's got a girl going off to college in a couple of weeks. When he left for Bible college, he had a dream. We were so thrilled. You went before them, right? You know what year you went? 90? 89. 89. It matters that a church keeps their dream. But you know, it also matters you young people keep your dream. And I mean young people that are 40. Because if you're not careful, the dream that got you started serving God will slowly settle down into complacency. You got a job, you got a house, you got a family, and that's enough. That's, by the way, that is enough to keep anybody busy. But if you don't keep that dream alive, you'll be as empty as America's church buildings. And your spiritual victory will be no greater than these empty churches where some pastor who should have retired a long time with Brother Beard was talking to another pastor, and I said, Brother Beard, Proverbs says a man's gift maketh room for him. You know, here's a pastor and his wife, and I figure, well, they're staying there because, you know, they, 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 they need a paycheck, and there's 12 people going. They've got a building that you could run a 1,000 in your church in it. And um, I said, go to the guy and offer him two thousand dollars a month paycheck the rest of his life and the rest of his wife's life he said that'd be like bribery wouldn't it i said absolutely it would be his retirement pension for all that he's done for god all these years because he probably didn't have a retirement and it'd be way cheaper than a mortgage because this guy's not going to live that long he'll die and the buildings will be yours Not one guy. Not one guy will. You know, they're looking. We don't need you. We don't want you. You young guys. And, and, and we just don't need you around here. They're dead. Their church is so spiritually dead. They don't care that they can't remember the last time a soul was saved. They don't care that the last time that there was a baptism. They don't care the last time there was a visitor in the door of the church. Because I've got my building and our bills are paid and we're just happy to be dead. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. What a horrible loss. What a tragic end for something that is alive and vibrant for God. When we're more concerned, ready? When we're more concerned about where the money's going than where the soul winners are going, we're in trouble. Let me say that again. When we're, this is in bold print. That means read it twice and there's a note. Yell here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I'll yell what I want to. <laughs> when we're more concerned about where the money's going than where the soul winners are going, we're in trouble. Yes, when we have more of a passion for dollars than we do for souls, we've lost our vision. When our deacons are more concerned with budgets than young preachers coming out of our youth department, we're in trouble. God have mercy on the church when we dream more of our young people having college degrees accepted by society than college degrees accepted in heaven. It was David Livingston I mentioned earlier that pulled out of medical school. Could you imagine the grieving parents? Oh, son, what are you doing? You can make money and support your mom and dad. And he dropped out of medical school to be a missionary to Africa in the 1860s. When there was no Skype and no cell phones and no any kind of phone and there was no airplanes and he took a boat and might never have gotten back there. Let's don't lose our dreams. Let's don't lose our dare because dreams have to be accompanied by a dare. 
Dreams have got to be accompanied by someone willing to step out and do that which no one else would do because everybody else has brains. We don't want to become so focused on our future security that we forget about security in heaven because we did that which God wanted us to do. Look over to Deuteronomy 23 with me. Deuteronomy 23, back in your Old Testament, fifth book of your Bible, Deuteronomy. The people of God had left Egypt. Boy, did they need God. They crossed the wilderness, Deuteronomy 23. They crossed the wilderness and oh, did they need God. They were, in, they were passionate. We need God. If we're going to live, we need God every day. We need the manna to come from heaven. And every day, we need that cloud, the Shekinah glory. And at night, we needed that pillar of fire, the glory of God, to guide us and to be his presence. And oh, we need God. On the sixth day, we need twice as much manna because we can't gather on the seventh day. And they gathered themselves together as they crossed 40 years down the wilderness and they're getting ready to cross the, the Jordan River. And they're coming into a place where there were houses that were paid for. Watch that now. Vineyards planted by someone else. Wells dug that they hadn't dug. And there were roads. There were cities. There were orchards. There was livestock. There was job security. There were pensions in 501 C3 2Ks. You say, don't you know what those things are? I have nothing like that, so why should I care? They had 401Ks in place. They had their CDs. I, I mean, Israel was right there at the Jordan River, and they were ready to cross over. And when they took Jericho, it was going to be the tide, the first city. Everything went to God. And they were going to take that, and they were going to walk into a place that for the first time in their lives, in the first time in their nation's history for 400 years, because they've been in Egypt 430 years, for the first time, they were about to have a home. A house. And they're going to stand out in front of that house and say, oh, I love my house. I got a house. Isn't it great? Yes, this is great. We have a house. Could we get a playground in the back? Oh, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Oh, could we get a playground in the back? We're going to have a house. We're going to have swings. And right down the road for the first time in their lives, they were going to have a church, a real church. For the first time in their lives, Dad was going to be able to go out and work his field and make his money. And for the first time in their lives, they were going to be able to come in. And when Passover came, it would be their home where they sacrificed a lamb. And it would be that lamb's blood that was offered and brought to the temple. And there would be their priest there. And all the wonders of security. They never had that. You know what God was concerned about? Look at this, look at this verse. Chapter 23, look at verse 6. Chapter 23, look down at verse 6. Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, all the days, all thy days forever. If you read this whole chapter, he says, you're going to cross this land, cross this river, and you're going to come into this land, and God said, don't try to live like they live. Don't seek their peace. The things that they rely on, don't rely on them. The things that they hold on to for security, don't trust in them. Look over to Ezra. You know the story. Israel's kings, the judges, and then the kings, and they get in trouble, they're carried away to Babylon. And again, they come back to Jerusalem, the book of Ezra, if you can find it. Right before Nehemiah. Find Job, Psalms going backwards toward the front of the Bible. Psalms and Job, and then you'll find... Uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther's in there somewhere. I don't know where it is. You find it. Ezra chapter 9. Use the table of contents. Ezra chapter 9. And here, the people of God, a second time, they've been carried away. And for 70 years, they've been gone. All these adults were born in Babylon except the oldest, oldest people. There were a few very, very aged people who remembered the, the, the temple of Solomon. And they were coming back under the command of God to rebuild this nation that was their nation. Oh, they're happy. You know, back here in Babylon, they didn't have homes. They really did. They had homes there, but it was never home home. 
They grew up there. They were educated as much as they got there. And, but now this is home. This is the land of our fathers. This is the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the land of David and Solomon and the land of the great kings of Israel, the giant armies and the great victories, and they're coming home. You know, you know what God's concerned about? In Ezra chapter 9, look at verse 12. I'm just, again, I'm taking this in the middle of a lengthy story. You can read these two chapters, one in Deuteronomy 23 and one in Ezra 9. You can get the whole context, but he's concerned. In Ezra 9, verse 12, he says, Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, Neither take their daughters unto your sons. And look at this phrase, same as we found back in Deuteronomy 23. Nor seek their peace, or their wealth, or their college diplomas, or their IRAs, CDs, and their security. Don't seek their wealth for whatever made that world wealthy. God said, don't you seek it. But it's more than that. He and Ezra add something. Look at the last half of that verse. That you may be strong. You know, when we seek, we're not going to stop there, but when we seek the wealth of this world, now I'm not against you having money in the bank, but it ought not be your big priority. I hope you have some retirement, but you shouldn't care a whole lot about it. Because the tighter you cling to the things of this world, the less you're going to be able to cling to the things of God. You know, faith causes us to operate on a plane that you can't see. And as long as we're hanging on to things, those are things we see. He says, be very careful. He says, don't you seek their peace. Don't give your daughters to their sons. Don't get their sons to your daughters that you may be strong. And look at the next phrase. And eat the good of the land. Look, this place is yours from God. God will take care of you. And look at the last phrase, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Now follow me. Back here, God says, you're coming back into this land. I'm going to give it to you and to your children forever. The inheritance that God planned, the, the, the inheritance God gave to those parents, God would pass on to the children if. If the mom and dad didn't seek the peace of the land and the wealth of the land. Now, let me explain. Let me get a couple of hymnals here. Who's, AJ, you got to learn not to sit in the front row. Come on up here and help me. Here's AJ. I'm God. And I say, here, this is your inheritance. You're going to go that way in a minute. This is your inheritance. And, and that's the inheritance I want you to pass on to your children. Now, he's got it, right? I need another. Come on up here, Josiah. You'd be A.J.'s son. <laughs> he married a very fair-skinned Jew. <laughs> you stay there. Now, as, that's an ugly son you got. <laughs> as A.J. travels in his Christian life, this is God's plan. He's not going to seek the wealth of this land. He's not going to seek the peace of this land. He's not going to associate. He's not going to let his sons or his daughters love in this land or marry the people of this land. And that's your inheritance. And he's going to pass that inheritance on to his son. That's the plan of God. Now, he got something from God and he carried it into this land. Now, let's get it back. And, and by the way, the, the next plan is for him to go on and give it to his children. That's the plan of God. Now, you give it back, and let me show you the real scenario that God's concerned about. Come back here. Um, Matt, you come on up and be the world, all right? I know you're, I don't usually use adults, but there's no other teenage girls. You'll be in the middle there. This is the, this is the world here. This is marrying the wrong, letting your kids date and marry the world. This is enjoying the, the movies more than preaching. This is enjoying the fun and the pleasures of the world and seeking their peace. What we just read, he said, don't seek their peace. Don't seek their prosperity. Don't seek their wealth. Forever. The things that make the world rich that they love, that's not what we're supposed to be seeking here. Now watch. He comes in as the Jew with the promises of God. He's got them. But he gets enjoying the world. So, Matt, you turn around. You're going to join up side by side with him. And he joins with the world. And he goes through. Now, see, because, let's wait for a minute, because he came in knowing how much he needed God, he got some great things. And then he became arm in arm with the world. 
You know what happens? Look at that last, just stay right there for a minute, guys. Look at that last phrase. In the end of verse 12, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. If we are not careful, if we team up here, here's what happens. These guys come along, and this next generation, you know what they see? They see this. And they go on together. Stop right there, you're going to run into the wall. Because your young people don't understand your faith. They understand your life. They understand your love. And here he sits. You know what this is to you and me? Preaching. Soul winning. Church building. Missions. You know what this is? This is youth departments with soul winning revivals and soul winning marathons. And this is the bus ministry. And this is a pure and holy life. And this is staying away from the casinos and the world and the pleasures of this world and the garbage of this world. And, and this is all the things. This is when we stay away from that. We get a holy walk with God and a humility and a love for, for God and a love for the Bible and a love for prayer and a love for the things of God. But you see, when he became friends with the world, the son didn't get these. Thank you. You can be seated, guys. Thank you. Let's go back a verse just to put it all in context. We're still in Ezra chapter 9. Go back to verse 7. Since the days of our fathers, Ezra 9, 7, since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our pri prince, priests, have delivered, been delivered to the hand of the kings of the lands. That was their Babylonian captivity to the sword and to captivity and to a spoil. Many of them died and were killed in battle. And the confusion of face as it is this day, such a mess and such confusion. You know why we're in the confusion we are in America today where we don't even know what gender you're supposed to marry? You know why we're there? Because you go back 40 or 50 or 60 years and the church people got comfortable with the world and they got the same values of the world, the same dreams of the world, the same goals of the world. Somewhere along in here, we got where that comfort zone in the world crept into our churches. Brother Beard told the men at the men's trip, he's using another church, renting it. They do all the building maintenance, all the grounds maintenance and everything, and then they pay a pretty good price to use the facilities. The Southern Baptist Church, they've been very good to Brother Beard, but, but the Southern Baptist meets there, and so they've got to meet real early in the morning and, and then get out of there, and I've gone up and preached for them on a Sunday, and I could just about get back here to preach uh, if we could just a little bit less driving time. And then they have an early service because they, their church has a, uh, the church is there, the handful that's there, and they're, they're good people. And they said to Pastor Beard, now, how do you get people to come just tell us. We'll do anything. Except that Saturday go out all over town thing. We ain't doing that. It's that Saturday go all over soul winning thing that's getting those people there. Now, let me tell you something. I've been up there on several occasions. I've preached there. Those people in that other church, they're good as gold. They are. Those people years ago started with all this. And they're sweet. You'd want them as your neighbor. You'd want them as a co-worker. You'd want them as a great-great-grandpa. Most of them were pretty old. And they, they embraced all these things. But you know what they passed on to their kids? Their kids aren't there anymore. He says, now therefore, in the beginning of verse 12... If not your daughters their sons, nor take their daughters into your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth. Make money. Have a good job. But seek the things that are eternal. Dream things for God. Here's our trouble. If we seek the things of the world, our children will seek the things of the world. And we who have the things of God and the things of the world will only pass on worldliness to our children. And therefore, they will only want worldly churches. And obviously, any young person from any home could end up following that path. But God give us some faithful Christians. God, that God would give us that dream to do something. 
That God would do something in our hearts. That he, would, that he would get us to have a passion for this book. That as our church gets older, we'd still long after the word of God. And as our bodies are weaker, we'd still say, God, use me for something in this Christian life. God, don't let me be useless. That the preaching would still excite us. And that Christian service would still move us. And that we'd be a part. You know what I love about our church is, is uh, the, the, no offense, but when people that may be older than would work on a bus are busy buying them or mechanicing on them. They didn't lose the vision. That's right. Amen. I was watching, we were coming back down from, from Bishop and we, we drove past this, I don't know what it was, some kind of a, a truck with, I would say it's a dune buggy, but I'm sure that's an archaic term dating me. But this thing had, it looked like it came off Rat Patrol and X-Men or something, all the steel sides and roll bars and gun turrets, and it was, it was just a beast for the desert. And I looked at that 20 years ago, and I said, oh, I'd like to jump over cliffs with that. I looked at it and thought, that looks like it would hurt. <laughs> if I drove that, it'd be going up and down hills like this. You know the guy who drives it flies it. I mean, you know, that's the thing. How long can we get all four wheels off the ground? Bang! I just think about that and my back hurts. Well, we got, I don't know how old Charles Cannon is, but Charles got no problem being out here hour after hour working on those buses and Don House with enough back surgeries and neck surgeries, he ought to be in a grave somewhere. If he had life insurance, his wife would have put him there, but... And isn't it good when people don't lose their vision? Isn't it good when people still want to see something happen for God? As an old man, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, listen as he said, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I'll come to dreams and revelations. He is an old man far down the road of life, and he says, I'm going to come to dreams, and I'll come to revelations, and God is going to do things in my life. You know this verse I preached a few weeks ago in Joel chapter 2. He says, you're, you're old men, and that come to pass in those days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. You know, God doesn't want old guys to stop dreaming. You, you guys that are, you were, you were here in the days when it was craziness trying to get a church built in a stupid tent. I wish we had pictures of Brother Mrs. Willie on top of our tent with laundry detergent and a garden hose and long-handled brooms brushing the dirt, washing our, t you ever try washing the top of a tent? Only Brother Ms. Woolley, only people in the world I know have ever done it. Because the rest of us were so fat we'd fall through it, but it, <laughs> they're skinny. You know, the dream, the dream to say, I want to have a big day and I want to go out and help and I want to do something, I want to see people saved and I want to be a, I, I wonder, are we still dreaming? Or have we, have we created a, a comfort zone here? I don't want to be comfortable as your pastor. I have no intention of being comfortable. I have no intention of you being comfortable. Now, you can get rid of me. That is one option. Or you can be uncomfortable. Or you can say, let's do something. You know, why did Jared and Angie go start a bus route? Not that you're old. You know, I realize you're married to a child, Jared, but you know, I, I'm glad our guys that were excited in 1992 when they left for Bible college still want to bring visitors on a bus in 2015. And Joel, he says your old men are going to dream dreams. Remember the story of Samuel? You can look at it sometime just for the sake of time. I'll just read you a verse. First Samuel 12. Samuel is a little bit frustrated with the people of God gotten mad at him. They've gotten carnal. Now their spiritual leader, Eli, and some others have let him down. But Samuel, and they, and they wanted a king. Samuel's children had gone astray. That happens. That doesn't mean you stop serving God. It means you still serve God. Your kids are going to face God for their decisions, and you face God for your decisions. But Sam, in 1 Samuel 12, Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I've hearkened to your voice, and all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. Go ahead. There's Saul. Take him. Now, why did they want that king? Out of the very words of the mouth of the people of God, they said, make us a king like all the other nations. 
Samuel said, all right, you want it? And by the way, God will give you what you want way more often than we wish he would. Now, Samuel says, behold, there's your king. He walks before you, and I am old and gray-headed. Behold, my sons are with you. They're there, but they're not walking right. But listen to Samuel. He said, I've walked before you from my childhood to this day. Remember, when Samuel was a little boy, God didn't let his words fall to the ground. Everybody knew what Samuel said was right. Now he's gray-headed. He's old. His kids have not followed the things of God. Israel wanted a king, and, he went, and God said, go ahead, give them a king if they want it. Then Samuel says in 1 Samuel 12, 3, Behold, here am I. Witness against me. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Who have I ever defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Whose hand have I received any bribe, bribe from? He says, I'll restore it to you right now. Speak up. If I've done wrong, tell me. And everybody said, oh, you, you're just fine. <laughs> Everything's okay. Samuel's an old gray-headed man. He didn't lose his vision. He was mad that everybody else had. And then a little bit later, you go back three chapters further. Remember Saul, the king, went out and God said, kill all Agag, kill all these people, and destroy them. And, and Saul saved the best of them. Now Samuel's an old man. He's gray-headed. He's old as could be. And Saul was so mad. This is a great verse. Then said, I mean, Samuel's an old man. And Samuel said, bring hither Agag, the king of the, of the Amalekites. Can't read it without my glasses. And Agag came to him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. The war's over. I'm going to make it out of this thing. And that's the priest. He's an old gray-headed preacher. He'll be fine. And he walked up. Samuel got a sword. Went, chop, 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 chop. <laughs> Chopped that guy into pieces. He said, That's what God told you to do. Samuel's old. He didn't lose his vision. In Acts chapter 23, verse 11, it says, The night following... The Lord stood by him, meaning Saul, or Paul the Apostle, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. He's in prison. Nearing the end of his life, and he's to be carried off to Rome. And God says to Paul, As thou hast testified to me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness at Rome. The Apostle Paul went to prison in Rome, and he wrote half your New Testament. From prison in Rome, he led people to Christ. From prison in Rome, he warned Titus and Timothy. And he said to Timothy, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. And here the apostle Paul is far, far away from young Timothy and Titus. And he said to the young preacher, You stay on track, and you preach the word, and you reprove people, and you rebuke people, and you keep your churches right. You know what's great about that old man as he sat in jail, and his life probably had nothing left to build. He was still worried about other people building. And I say to you that are older here, you ought to be worried about young men building their lives for God. Don't you old guys, don't, don't you give up. We to, now young people, it's none of your business to chew out other young people. You old guys, you've got to write. As an aged man, Paul pushed the young preachers to stay right. And I'll just close with Joshua. The end of his life, Joshua 24, 15, Joshua says, If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve. You want to serve the devil? You want to serve the devil? Just go ahead. An old man standing there before this crowd of people that he'd led for those decades from when Moses died until the land of Canaan was just about completely subdued. And Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you serve. Go ahead, just like Elijah did on Mount Carmel. If it seem evil to you to serve God, then go ahead and serve the other crowd. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He wasn't going to give. Big decisions to be made about this matter of dreaming. We've got to decide, what is it that matters to us today? What is it we want? Are we willing to step out and, and say, I want to see something done for God and for his glory? Why? with, uh, not to pick on anybody, but why is Connie and Steve McDowell running this amazing bus route out there and Steve's health's not good and Connie's health's not good and just buried her dad and 
they didn't lose their dream. Just because they're 150 years old, <laughs> they didn't lose their dream. The day this church resembles a business more than a place of faith, it's all done. This isn't a business. Never has been a business. Because you have to have money to run a business. <laughs> this is a living organism. Hopefully yielded to the Spirit of God to go out to that world with the message of salvation. Let's don't lose that. Father, bless us tonight. Help us to keep our vision. Help us to keep our thinking right. That you have done great things for us and among us goes without saying. But Lord, I pray you'd help us that we wouldn't live in yesterday's victories. About 10 weeks from now, we'll have a big day here in the property. We'll hopefully have groceries and turkeys to give out, and we'll hopefully have buses running double runs, and we'll have just a week away a soul winning revival with soul winning twice a day and preaching every night for just four quick nights. Help us, Lord, to keep our vision alive. Help us to keep our dreams alive. Help us to realize that the, the peace that this world seeks after isn't the peace we want. We want the peace that passes understanding. As we get older, we may, we, may we be careful not to get more concerned about economic security than we are with spiritual prosperity at home as well as at church. Lord, bless us. Help us. Keep us fresh. God, deliver us from the dead complacency of spiritless, lifeless things called churches. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for a moment of invitation.